architecture has broadly defined that as how genomes are contained within a cell and how the information is structured within the genome of the human cell. Um, here are some examples of species that have unusual genome architecture. Um, Giardia contains subcellularic RNA and hypervariable phenotype. And then we've got these deloid rotor birds that are crazy weird that rebuild their genomes following double strand breaks, sort of like a mitotic recombination. And then we have my favorite Eternina thermophila is a, uh, a ciliate that um, has two genomes that are contained within separate nuclei. And these genomes differ in genome size, chromosome size or number, and poiety between these two genomes. So all these features can affect the origin and maintenance of genetic variation within a population. Additionally, mating systems can also affect patterns of genetic variation and how it's distributed, because mating systems govern how genetic variation is distributed within a population. So with ASEX, um, ASEX has like a fixed heterozygosity, which is favorable when you have favorable genetic combination. However, the lack of accommodation can allow those best mutations to accumulate over time. With sexual reproduction, there are uh, two ways to do it. Inbreeding, which will decrease heterozygosity and will increase homozygosity, which will be bad. Sometimes for those dogs, you just have to let them go with it. Um, and, but it can be beneficial if Um, and then for outbreeding, you have an increase in heterozygosity, which can be good because it generates genetic variation, but it could also break up any favorable inter, uh, genetic interactions. So my question regarding these two things is, how does gen genome architecture and mating system of a species influence the amount of genetic variation for fitness in a population? So here's a little background on so the species of study is Tetrahydrothermophila, and this is how the two genomes work. They have a germline micronucleus, which I like to call mice or germline interchangeably. This uh, the genome within the micronucleus is transcriptionally inactive except during death. It is diploid, and so this would be the genotype that might be hidden until after sex. So after sex, the somatic macronucleus is developed from this micronucleus, which is active during vegetative or asexual growth. And this genome is polyploid, so there's 45 copies of every single chromosome within that micronucleus. This is what is going to be exposed to selection. Another weird thing that Tetrahymna does is phenotypic assortment. So unlike normal cells, normal eukaryotic cells, during meiosis, or they, during mitosis, they don't, the chromosomes don't align normally. They just copy and then segregate independently. And so, in the instance of an individual that has a heterozygous micronucleus, so for two alleles, at one gene, you have a heterozygous and a micronucleus. From that, it'll, it can, um, it'll generate a new macronucleus having copies of either of these two alleles. Over time, they, they segregate independently, um, one cells will become homozygous for either one allele or another. And um, so this would, since they're getting recessive alleles, they'll be fully exposed to selection over time in the somatic nucleus, even though the um, micronucleus still remains heterozygous for both. So what my main question is, is how does genome architecture and mating system of this tetrahydra thermophila influence genetic variation for fitness. So here's what I did. So to start with, I worked with natural populations of tetrahydra thermophila. And this is just showing you where um, they've been collected. And the different colors represent the different natural populations. And these four different populations are genetically differentiated from one another. So with these isolates from these natural populations, I compare the fitness of what I call wild strains and inbred and benighted inbred crosses and outbred crosses. So the wild
bottom strands represent the asexual lineage, and they are used with the parental strains for all the other, for the, the crosses after. So with inbred crosses, we have this little trick we can do inside the hive that we can create whole genome homozygotes in both nuclei, and it's called genome exclusion. I'll talk about that in the next one. And then my outbred crosses, I made it just two parental strains, two parental wild strains of each other, and that's their fit. So for all of these different three types of individuals, I measure their fitness by the maximum growth rate, which we call our max. So just looking at the fitnesses of the inbred and the wild strains, on the top, so on both graphs, the y-axis represents the mean relative fitness, and then the x-axis represents, on the top graph, the wild strains, fitness of the wild strains, and on the bottom is the fitness of the inbred offspring. Um, so what we see is that for the wild strains, except for those two little outliers, there's not as much variation in fitness as there is for the inbred strains. And so if you focus on the bottom graph, you'll see that some of these um, points have stars over them or they have uh, plus signs over them. And so the stars represent um, the uh, inbred crosses, which were significantly inbred offspring, which were significantly different from their wild parents. And then the plus signs represent a significant effect of uh, genomic exclusion lines, which now I will talk about. So there are five, five particular strains that have a significant effect of their uh, genomic exclusion lines. And so genomic exclusion lines, what are those? So the process of genomic exclusion it's a lot to explain, but I'm gonna try and do it as quickly and as concise as possible. Um, so we have an individual, so we have two routes of mating to go through genomic exclusion. So we mate an individual route wild strain, assuming that it's heterozygous, and it's at least its germline. And we mate it with a star strain that has an inactive micronucleus. And from that, we would get um, progeny that would either have, that would be homozygous in their micronucleus that would be for one allele or another. And from that, it's just going to be developed from the original micronucleus, the parental micronucleus. And so you'll end up, by round two of genome exclusion, you'll end up with um, a GE line that would either be pure, purely homozygous for one allele or another. And so if there's multiple alleles, we would we did multiple GE lines to see if we get all of the alleles that might be present. So when we look, so the significant effect of GE line would be that there's a particular allele that might have a different fitness from another GE, GE line. And so if you look at um, A at the top, you can see that there's three separate GE lines, and one of them has a significantly different fitness than the other two GE lines. And also the same thing we see in graph C at the bottom, and as I said in the previous graphs, the y-axis is the mean relative fitness, and then the x-axis represents each individual GE line and their, and their fitness. So for some of these, we see no variation in fitness, no significant difference in fitness, but for um, some of them, we do. So what this tells us is that this, um, this mating, the mating and these, mating and inbreeding mating reveals hidden genetic variation within that micro, that was hidden within the micronuclear genome. So this is expressed when we look at between the different GE lines. We also find that micronuclear variation has both beneficial and deleterious effects. So this is some data on comparing the outbred offspring to our wild, wild strains and the inbred offspring. So on the top graph is um, the change in mean fitness for each outbred cross between wild, the wild and the outbred offspring. And we see that there is variation. However, when we take it as a whole, um, the overall change in fitness is not significantly different from zero. And when we look at the bottom where it's the inbred versus the outbred, we see the same thing. We do see variation 
variation in fitness between the inbred and the outbred offspring. However, when we take the mean, we can compare the mean overall, it's also not significantly different, uh, different than zero. So, so <laughs> these, this evidence, though, to refer back to my hypothesis about a genome architecture and mating system um, affecting affecting variation in fitness due to hidden variation within the germline genome. Um, we found that fitness varied among the asexual, asexually divided wild isolates. And we also found that fitness, <laughs> um, uh, mating reveals hidden var genetic variation within the migrating human genome. And that this variation has both beneficial and deleterious effects. And so from this, our results say that the fitness of our, our inbred and outbred can't be predicted just based on the wild pairings, but the GE lines from a single wild off isolate often differ in fitness, which reveals heterozygosity that is hidden within the migrant pairing. So this matches our expectation that selection is limited in its ability to operate on mutations in germline micronucleus that might accumulate during asexual reproduction. So, I'd like to thank you, and I'm just on time. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I, you can remember to call my dad after this and tell him to do Father's Day. <laughs>